My name is Ingrid Samuel. I'm a Historic Environment Director at the National Trust. In my former life, I was also Head of Heritage and Architecture at the Department for Culture, so I, I am rather worryingly in this room can confess to having been uh, a bit of a man from the ministry or perhaps a woman from the ministry at, at one point in time. This session has been created to explore who has responsibility for heritage protection. And it's a chance, I hope, for us to have a really needy discussion, as we've already started to do this morning. And I think it'll follow on really nicely from Lloyd's talk and set us up for the fifth and final session about the future of heritage protection. For me, both sessions feel really relevant and important at a sort of key moment in time where significant changes are proposed to English heritage, a potential deep oceanic current, perhaps. Public finances remain very tight. The impacts felt not just by in, um, national agencies like English Heritage, but of course local authorities as well. And for that matter, our private owners, who, for whom the impact of austerity is likely to be felt for years to come. So what we're going to do about this is a question we'll explore in much more detail after lunch and we'll feed in the thoughts that you've already brought to us through your postcards. Um, but inevitably, I think a lot will start to come out here as well on this session on responsibility. For those of you who didn't make it before we start, I just wanted to touch on the interesting debate we had last night, which was specifically about the role of government in heritage. None of our speakers really championed the idea of the government as a champion for heritage, which was actually the motion for the House. And in fact, most were pretty united in the belief that government's role was to set an appropriate legislative, fiscal, and regulatory framework, throw a bit of money around, and then just to get out. Creating the right environment for, as one of the assignments said, creating the right environment for other people, from heritage and community groups to owners, to go about their business. It's down to the citizen to be a champion for their heritage. And Lloyd reminded us of something really similar this morning uh, when he talked about the heritage movement being driven by individual passions. Uh, and he noted that government got on the bandwagon relatively late and are about to get off. Um, what was not discussed, I suppose, about this framework for government was how we all feed into that, and I guess that's something we can pick up today and I hope we discuss. And another thing that, uh, that sort of came up was quite a series of mixed opinions about how well the government is doing in terms of their framework role. Um, Lloyd mentioned today the lack of a beneficial tax regime. Last night the focus was much more on development pressure. And after a rocky start, however, there did seem to emerge some sort of consensus around Simon Jenkins' initially rather contentious point that actually government has sort of got the plot on buildings. Uh, Lloyd suggested something similar in, in one way today by when he noted that you know, in the year of celebration for the 1913 Act, he's heard no one suggest that it hasn't been or wasn't a good thing. Although, um, I take the point that was made earlier today that maybe that's a bit more about trophy buildings and there's a real challenge around inter inner cities being hollowed out. The big concern for a lot of our panelists last night the thing being salami sliced by government and developers is actually what Simon Jenkins called rural heritage. But what I think he meant is our heritage of cultural and natural landscapes and green spaces, urban, peri-urban, and countryside. And Lloyd mentioned again today, we can't lie down and let the countryside be paved over. In the end, the panel seemed to agree um, that what can and cannot be done to an individ individually designated building or monument are actually the easy cases. That battle has more or less been won, according to the panel discussed. But the big arguments today are about spaces between the buildings and also about good design. It's not about change or no change. Development needs to happen, but it's about how we fit new things into old spaces. The battle line should not be drawn between old and new, but rather good and bad development. So that was the night that was. It'll be interesting to see if our panel today shares some of these perspectives about the role of government and where the challenges lie for us. And so we're gonna go to them now. Each speaker is gonna have 15 minutes, and then I'll throw the floor open to the now familiar half hour session for question and comment. 
And I'm going to introduce each speaker before their talk because I think their background and their experience will provide valuable context for their perspectives and, and what they bring to their papers. So our first speaker is Stephen Trowe. He is Heritage Protection Director at English Heritage. And as such, it's a perfect choice to kick off this session to explore the different contributions that individuals and organizations should be making to protecting our heritage. In his day job, Steve is responsible for the coordination of what I might once have called English Heritage's National Heritage Protection Plan. But I think something that's slowly coming to feel a bit more like it just might someday belong to a wider group of stakeholders. In his current role, he's also responsible for much of English Heritage's important applied research program. His last role was as EH's very knowledgeable head of national rural and environmental advice, which I think is a key role actually in heritage protection terms, as whatever you think about Simon Jenkins's green spaces argument, we do know that rural heritage, <coughs> and by that I mean vernacular farm buildings and archeological monuments, like industrial heritage, remains an area of real significant challenge. Steve is an archeologist by training, he has been an inspector of ancient monuments dealing with designation and casework, and he's also worked at the British Museum and the Museum of London. And he's going to talk about, with great power comes great responsibility, the changing role of the expert in protecting the nation's heritage. Thanks, Ingrid. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The uh, superhero theme to this morning. Um, with great power comes great responsibility. Many of you, I'm sure, will recognize this as the mantra that Stanley gave to his uh, creation, Spider-Man. The more expensively educated amongst you will also know that um, <laughs> Voltaire beat him to it, but because he wasn't able to use graphic artwork, he really didn't win the uh, battle of hearts and minds. Um, in this session, to consider responsibility of heritage protection, I want to examine the particular responsibility which is borne by the expert, and just reflect a bit on the way this has changed over time and is continuing to change. And the reason I want to focus on expertise uh, is because I consider it to be the absolute keystone of the protection system that we operate today. Ours is not a quantitative discipline, it's not a science. Our decisions on designation, on consent, and on investment are all based on judgments. Uh, and while we can certainly uh, systematize our approach to decision making, we can support our thinking with science, and we can make our judgments far more transparent. At the end of the day, it will still uh, be the expert view that lies at the heart of nearly everything that we do. And the idea of the interrelationship between power and responsibility neatly encapsulates what's changed most about the role of the heritage expert over time. It's a little pick I picked up from Stephen Bacon. <laughs> Um, as that conference is already making clear, <laughs> responsibility for managing England's historic environment rests with many different actors. Amongst those bearing and sharing responsibility are land managers and property owners, developers and others in the private sector, third sector organisations, local communities, universities, that's what we heard talking about HRC partnerships today, and of course government acting locally, centrally and through its agencies. English Heritage as an agency of government is therefore only one small cog in a pretty complex machine. And I must stress it's a cog that most certainly does not have a monopoly on expertise. Nevertheless, I would suggest that English Heritage does have something particularly pertinent to say in terms of the role of the expert for two main reasons. <coughs> Firstly, because we're tasked by government with being its expert advisor on the historic environment. And secondly, because we still employ a significant number of heritage experts who have the advantage of being able to work collegially and with a sort of critical mass that's not always available to experts in other organisations. As our conference is in intended to look uh, backwards as well as forwards, I thought I would start with a very brief canter through the early days of the government heritage expert, days when all of those um, charged with exercising their expertise on behalf of the state could almost certainly be fitted into a single, small, and almost certainly smoke-filled room. The attention of those experts was almost wholly focused on the national collection of historic properties in state care. Any new acquisitions to which were dictated pretty largely by their personal academic predilections. The expert view was paramount, if occasionally thwarted by the ministry's political masters. 
Accountability to the public was pretty well an alien concept. The emphasis was on authority in all senses of the word, and this is attested by the uh, and wonderful but rather forbidding armor plated signage which adorned the ministry's properties, signs which exude uh, power rather than responsibility. <coughs> Can't get away with that plugging the boss's book, but it's important to say that um, such elitist attitudes were, of course, not um, isolated to the world of heritage. But they did survive in our discipline for an alarmingly and surprisingly long time, as um, men from the ministry makes recounts in the late 1970s. The Department of the Environment's Publicity Office had to go it alone when they wanted to produce a set of, of publicly accessible guidebooks because the then Chief Inspector refused to do, do so, fearing a sort of catastrophic decline in academic standards. And thirty, um, some thirty characterises uh, the um, final days, the heyday of uh, the department in the 1970s as supremely confident, but not to say arrogant, in its abilities and achievements. But clearly, by the 60s and 70s, change was in the air, and the ministry's stranglehold was sort of in decline. Ideas about what were, uh, comprised the heritage were changing rapidly. Interest was developing in entire landscapes and townscapes, rather than isolated buildings and monuments behind railings. Uh, the astonishing scale of the historic resource was beginning to be appreciated and captured in exponentially growing records. And increasingly, other players began to lead the agenda. So a great example of this was the way that industrial archaeology, as a key aspect of our uh, heritage, uh, was pioneered not by the inspector, but by the Royal Commission of the Council for British Archaeology. Attitudes of change to the expert advisor uh, began to change really quickly through the 1980s, and I think much of this did own, uh, its, uh, was owed to the creation of English heritage, which with admirable foresight was given a statutory duty to, pro to pro promote public enjoyment and knowledge. Public enjoyment and knowledge, really important for the time. Um, and here you can see the first English Heritage Commission and guest getting ready to whip up a, a, a storm of public enjoyment. <laughs> <laughs> that, that really is 1984, it's hard to imagine, isn't it? Um, I'd also suggest that change was driven by the hugely increased emphasis on public service, which ran through all parts of government in the 80s and the 90s. Although John Major's Citizens Charter was pretty widely derided at the time, it did herald a real change of attitude amongst public servants in terms of accountability. And change was also propelled by the growth of an increasingly um, vigorous and vociferous heritage sector themselves, together with changing attitudes amongst heritage professionals uh, in their own right. Within English heritage, this changed professional and corporate attitude was marked by two key milestones. One was the publication of Power of Place in 2000, with its emphasis on the, historic, uh, the, the holistic historic environment, the need for sector-wide partnership, the importance of heritage to communities, and the validity of multiple narratives. And the second was the publication of Conservation Principles eight years later, which championed similar ideas, but with an additional emphasis on significancy and transparency in decision-making, and Paul spoke to us yesterday about that. So that was my rapid retrospective. I want to turn now to where we are in the present day. What is the role of the expert in today's heritage conservation system, and how is it evolving? It's, it's fair to say that English heritage is thinking a lot about this at the moment, not least in the context of the major cuts that we've experienced, uh, cuts which have made, had to involve the loss of some of our expert staff, and cuts that are leading to the loss of expertise right across the sector, not least in uh, local government, as Mark Mayers reminded us yesterday. This is undoubtedly a really serious challenge for us. It's self-evident, but it's still worth spelling out that if any organisation is required to act as the government's expert advisor, then it really does need to be able to access and command expertise. And we're facing this challenge um, when the task of the expert advisor is becoming infinitely more difficult um, than it was in the golden days of the uh, predecessors in the Ministry of Works. In the intervening years, ideas on what um, the heritage comprises have expanded enormously. It now embraces the everyday as well as the exceptional, the ultra-modern as well as the ancient, the intangible as well as the material, despite what the panel thought last night. <laughs> um, 
At the same time, while we know about our longer held areas of interest, um, has also increased exponentially in complexity and in depth. We face an explosion of data and specialization. The ability for any of us to achieve any sort of overview is increasingly a challenge. The heritage is also more demotic. It's recognized to be everywhere, to be the essence of place, to, the, to be the business, the rightful business of local communities as well as national organizations, uh, and to embrace the heritage of people who are underrepresented in our society. And it's this, this universality in the concept of heritage that in turn creates conflicts between the historic environment and a range of other interests. On one hand, as a sector, we need to accommodate other environmental interests, bats, badges, energy efficiency, and on the other, we are told we need to um, avoid impeding the guttering flame of economic growth. This poses real challenges for those who, like the experts at English Heritage or in local government, have to advise government on an increasingly kaleidoscopic, fast-moving, contested and politically critical heritage landscape. Their decision-making can, in can influence investment projects worth millions. Their decision-making can intervene in bitter local disputes, such as the case for or against a wind farm or um, the preservation of what we consider to be a gem and the locals consider to be an arsenal. Um, decisions are exposed to in intense press scrutiny nowadays, and they're expected to stand up at public inquiry and even in court. So, in this challenging environment, when our resources are under immense pressure, I do think the sector needs to seriously focus on the issue of expertise. What, uh, what do we want experts? What do we want of those experts if we think we need them? How should they operate? Should expertise come from the public or from the private sector? And above all, how do we ensure that the public trusts and values its heritage experts? Within English Heritage, we've begun to make some modest headway in changing the way we nurture and deploy our expertise, although we do recognize that far more needs to be done. First and foremost, I think we, we now recognize that while English Heritage can expect to be expert in some things, cannot maintain expertise in everything in which it, the sector, and the government has an interest. What's vital, therefore, is that our in-house experts are part of an effective network that can draw on external advice, whether that comes from the public, private, or independent sectors. It requires our staff to have the ability to effectively stimulate, source, commission, evaluate, and use the research of others. Our experts are also learning to work in a rapidly changing world. They're de delivering more quickly and more flexibly. They're applying their skills to hold new areas of heritage on tight timescales. It's perhaps no coincidence that an increasing number of our younger professionals um, are coming from the private sector and bringing with them skills of flexibility and adaptability. Importantly, we're now um, deploying our expertise within the framework provided by our constructive conservation philosophy working ever more closely with industry and government and alert to the challenges of growth agenda. Um, for example, as an example um, our experts have recently completed a project which assessed a large number of signal boxes ahead of their being decommissioned by Network Rail. Um, it was a proactive project, working with Network Rail, it was transparent and it was cooperative and it was greatly valued by that organisation. We're now using similar models to work with the Ministry of Defence and soon the, the Homes and Communi Communities Agency. And this marks a major effort, as Roger was saying yesterday, to move our designation effort from the reactive to the st strategic. Um, also, I didn't have a chance to pair with Roger in advance, he mentioned this, um, we, we try to make our expert decision making more transparent and accountable. So, for example, we're producing selection guides designed to make our thinking, to open up our thinking to the public and to professional scrutiny. We are trying to ensure that our designation decisions are based on explanation rather than on mystique. And our experts are also working much more closely with communities, harnessing new technology to draw in their knowledge, understanding and enthusiasm. Our project on the Luton hatting industry typifies this, focused on, focusing on a town little regarded for its heritage and with a poorly record, re, uh, recorded industry, it new, used new media such as Facebook to draw in the community and help them share their knowledge and enthusiasm. 
We're also learning to build appreciation of hitherto underrepresented people, places, and historic assets, accepting that we have no particular expertise in these areas, but that we can help to enable and connect up those who do. Our recent project, for example, on represented heritage, has already led to two uh, PhD studentships uh, beginning to research previously underrepresented areas. And we're using training um, through our programs of advice, guidance, training, and masterclasses, and so on. We're working hard to try and build capacity within the sector in order to enforce its resilience in tough times. Um, and it's worth stressing because of our, our partnership in this conference with HRC, we're working a lot more closely with the university sector and with the research councils. We funded uh, a new course in Cambridge, for example, recently, and have primed it and set it on its way, uh, which fills a gap in the market. And we have commenced a programme of collaborative doctor awards with AHRC and others. In this way, we're taking a much more proactive role in growing and shaping the experts that we and others in the sector will need in the future. And finally, I have to mention the National Heritage Protection Plan, even though we're not allowed to say National Heritage or Protection anymore. <laughs> so I'll refer to it as the plan. <laughs> it's not our plan, it's your plan. Implicit in the plan is the issue of wiring up expertise from right across the sector to achieve the best conservation results possible. And we're delighted that an increasing number of bodies are working with us to do this. The challenge of the plan is to share power as well as responsibility, and if it works, this is the result will be shared successes. So, uh, the challenge I was also given is, uh, is who is responsible for the heritage? And uh, in my view, uh, the, the basic point uh, is that it is the owners of the historic buildings. And uh, a lot has been said about government, but what we have found at SAVE and uh, over the years is that government may say one thing, but government departments may do something completely different. And uh, Obviously, this has been incredibly important that so many government departments have been shedding their buildings over the last two or three decades, and uh, uh, it has pr produced some really Im immense challenges. And uh, one of the first ones we came across, one of the worst examples, was when we, we uh, came across the Home, home Office, which uh, obviously looks after prisons, and they had this rather splendid house in Leicestershire called Stock and Hall, and beside it was a young offenders establishment. and. Uh, we were trying to work out why they were leaving this house, uh, which was eminently saleable, just left there to rot. But when eventually we got on site and we, 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 we met them, uh, we, we had this uh, 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 meeting actually in Marshall Street, and we said to them, you know, why can't you just sell the historic buildings? And they said, because it means we have to move the pigsties. So he said, right, <laughs> what is this about pigsties? He said, well, it's a prison farm and the pigsties will cost £900,000 to remove. And the man from the DOE said, really, that couldn't be more than £300,000. And uh, anyway, he said, well, we, he said, Kit Martin said, well, we're going to get a cost of building you the most finest new pigsties uh, uh, in Europe. And we got the cost, and it was £57,000. <laughs> uh, but it really brought us on to the fact that whatever Parliament says, whatever governments say, there is somehow this in deep uh, 
belief, which seems to perhaps emanate from the Treasury, but it is in so many government departments, that it is actually not just a waste of money, but really a sin to allow money to be spent on historic buildings, and that you should really help them uh, to, to be dismissed and uh, you know, show that they are at the end of their useful life. Uh, and regardless of the actual expense, you may then uh, roll forward in terms of commissioning extremely expensive and pro probably not very efficient uh, new buildings. Uh, but this has been our challenge, and I, once we went to Gibraltar to look at what's called the naval heritage, not so important, but uh, of course very important there, as well as the military. And there we saw, on Rosier Bay, where of course Victory was brought in, uh, there were these delightful Regency houses, which were officers' houses. Now they'd all been declared redundant uh, for, 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 for current use, because although there was a need for officers' housing, uh, it had they looked at the latest treasury regulations and it said that uh, officers were not to live in houses which had more than three steps up to the front door. And uh, 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 another regulation was that the car parking space should be not more than ten yards away from the front door. Now, these things didn't quite meet <laughs> the regulations. So as a result, a whole succession of these lovely houses were, were sold off or given back to the Gibraltar government who then said, oh, well, we can't have these historic buildings without any endowment to look after them. So although they were in fine condition when they were handed over, the Gibraltar government then held out for more funds, uh, supposedly <coughs> to restore them. But uh, this led on to a same exhibition on the buildings of the Ministry of Defence. And it was incredibly difficult to get information out of the Ministry of De Defence. They said, you know, no, top secret, we can't tell you what our list of buildings are, no, we can't give you a list of sites, we can't do this, etc." Anyway, we put on our exhibition, Deserted Bastions, at the, uh, uh, at, uh, at the RMA Heinz Gallery. And then uh, Lord Salisbury, who was uh, uh, the junior minister at the Ministry of Defence at that time, took it to heart. And he actually introduced a whole series of very responsible policies which were set out. And the Ministry of Defence then had uh, you know, policies for looking after their listed buildings, for assessing the repairs needed then policies for redundancy procedures, and it really seemed that a new, new era had opened. Indeed, it did open uh, at the Ministry of Defence. But at the same time, we were doing a series of uh, uh, exhibitions, or reports rather, on hospitals. And the, uh, the health service proved to be you know, one of the absolute worst of this, because they had spent great fortune, considerable amounts of money on looking after their estate while it was in use, and particularly the mental hospitals, which were great big buildings, uh, on impressive sites, south-facing, on hillsides, uh, usually by good architects and very impressive compositions in large landscape grounds. They were immaculately maintained, but as soon as uh, the last patients or the last staff left, they just abandoned them. And so vandalism started, and uh, a whole, a whole series of uh, steps of decline started taking place. But worse was that idea that they couldn't perceive that the old building could have a use. The only value they could see was in selling off the grounds. But actually, of course, some of these spaces have been well restored, and the grounds have been the great key to, 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 to their successful reuse as housing. And one of the worst examples was Exvale. I don't know, some of you may have seen outside uh, outside Exeter, and this is a really spectacular uh, uh, complex of buildings with a great sort of central tea caddy uh, he headquarters and then a radial plan. And the, uh, the health service sold off plot by plot to developers, which were all built round. And they put a covenant saying that the old building could not be used for residential use because it might compete with the new plots. And of course, <laughs> there was no other use for it. Well, finally, thanks to Jocelyn Stevens weighing in in spectacular fashion. English Heritage, I think, uh, put in you know, a really good uh, injection of funds, £900,000. And although this building, you know, every slate had been stripped off the roof, uh, it was then returned, uh, it was converted to residential use, and it's become a very smart and nice place to live. Uh, but the extraordinary thing was that, uh, you know, as a result of these battles uh, with the major government, we actually got an extremely important document, uh, which is called Guidance Note for Departments on the Disposal of uh, Surplus Historic Buildings. And it says, all surplus historic buildings, and particularly those which are vacant or only partially used, should be disposed of as quickly as possible. 
And then it goes on to say, maximization of receipts should not be the overriding aim in cases involving the disposal of historic buildings. The aim should be to obtain the best return for the taxpayer that is consistent with government policies for the protection of historic buildings and areas. And these policies are likely to limit opportunities for the realization of development value. Now that was a really sensible policy. It was put out by government, but I, I, I hardly ever see it referred to. And uh, we so often come, against, uh, come up against departments saying, oh no, no, we've got to realize the best value. We've got to, uh, that, that can only come with, come with redevelopment. Uh, but also, the other thing it says there is that government departments should actually put their buildings on the market. And uh, a classic example to me of them not doing this is in Portsmouth Dockyard, which of course is a huge visitor attraction, uh, uh, next to it is this wonderful building dating from 1700, uh, which is the old uh, Naval Academy. And uh, it's uh, a red brick uh, REM type building, and it's been left empty, and it is now starting to leak, and it's getting into a serious uh, 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 state of uh, uh, disrepair. And the Navy won't make up its mind. Uh, I've been trying to get in there, we won't get not, not, not let in. And, uh, it's this business of government departments, you know, needing constant prodding and reminding to actually do the duty which has been set out before them. Uh, <clears throat> but actually, this needs to extend really to all the sort of public sector owners of, of, uh, of uh, uh, historic buildings or with, with historic estates. And I remember uh, we, one of our exhibitions at Save, our first one, frankly, it was called Off the Rails Saving Railway Architecture. And fortunately, it was just as Peter Parker uh, arrived at uh, uh, British Rail. And anyway, he invited us and Simon Jenkins uh, to spar with him, as he put it. Anyway, it led to the establishment of the uh, Environment Panel. And I remember being told by a very senior railwayman, he said, look, Marcus, what you've got to understand, the railways have three priorities. First is the track. Second, the rolling stock. And only third, the building. And we're a public sector organisation, there will never be any money to be spent on the historic building. So forget it. So, uh, I have to point out, well, if you have all these really shabby, you know, decrepit looking stations, it might put uh, some people off uh, ever coming out and we go, 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 going by rail. But, <laughs> anyway, Simon Jenkins with Peter Parker set up the Railway Heritage Trust. Uh, and from a modest beginning of £1 million a year, uh, and I was one of the first directors and still am. Uh, we've, we went on to spend uh, 25 million in the first 21 years, and it was really a very useful model because it was a kind of top up fund for all the different railway departments and areas and regions so that if they had a listed building and it seemed to cost that much more to repair, they could come to us. And our grants were, were actually a fund provided by Network Rail, but they would come to us and we could top up their budgets. But more than that, we could actually go out and go to whatever town or, or, or city or, or uh, area they were in and we could say, you know, please come English Heritage, please come Development Fund, please come uh, uh, other local people who are involved. And we would put in 20% and we would get five other matching 20%, which all go up to build quite a big pot, which may make it possible to repair uh, these different uh, uh, these historic buildings which were formerly said to be too expensive to repair. I remember at one stage I was at, uh, at uh, uh, we were standing on Durham Station and uh, it was leaking and it was looking quite desperate and nobody could work out what to do. So I said, well, why don't we just do one section? We'll start at one end of doing the platform canopy, you know, uh, uh, canopy. and if it looks good, then we'll decide what to do next. Well, no, we agreed to do that. And they were all so pleased to see it all painted out and the passengers liked it and everything. So the whole thing got done. And I think this kind of uh, uh, th uh, approach needs to be rolled out across uh, the, the public sector. Uh, and of course, uh, another example we, is local authorities. That local authorities are obviously suffering tremendous cutbacks, uh, but they are very important custodians of historic buildings. Uh, there are their own historic buildings, uh, which of course are town halls. And on the one hand, you have examples uh, like Birkenhead and Oldham, where you know, really fine town halls are virtually empty or have been empty for some considerable time. And uh, it's a really desperate situation. 
But on the other side of the Pennines, in, uh, in Kirklees, there's an absolutely wonderful example, just through having one good sort of officer who wants to get the town halls there. And he had four town halls in Kirklees, Dewsbury, anyway, four of them. And uh, when I read it up in the Times, you know, he explained that you know, in every week, uh, 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 they were getting things happening in each town halls. It wasn't just for the councillors to meet. He'd really put them at the heart of the community to explain that the rooms like this in every town hall you know, could be used you know, for all sorts of societies, events, uh, classes, and uh, uh, equally the town halls put to use in, in weddings. And again, this is a, a, an area which is crucial. And of course the other great thing which has happened with local authorities is that they have been the saviors of many great houses Aston Hall in Birmingham is the first and perhaps most famous, but uh, uh, then that was followed uh, by, by Woolerton in, in Norwich, and uh, also uh, uh, Temple Newsom. Temple Newsom is, a, is a, a museum of you know, national quality, but it is left with not a single curator, and the, the last retired curator has to come back two days a week just to do the sort of minimal curatorial job, and Heaton Hall. Another one, why it's a beautiful house in, 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 uh, outside Manchester. When I went there earlier this year, uh, you know, the, the main front, which you see in all, all, all the books, you know, still got the great dome and the columns and looks fantastic. But go round the back, and one wing is completely boarded up since it was burnt out by a, by a squatter who was up in <laughs> living above the golf club, apparently, in one wing. And the other wing, which was the restaurant, is all shut up. But then, Go to Lydia Trigo's, and that one person, one really imaginative lady, uh, got that whole house going in a phenomenal way. And you know, get, uh, get a few people like that, and you know, one really energetic, imaginative person can get great things going at that local authority level. Uh, but two minutes, right? Uh, so another example, of course, is schools, uh, and there, there are a great many schools. And a classic example was uh, uh, Hampshire County Council, which had its own architecture department. They restored wonderfully uh, uh, many schools. They built exciting new buildings. They put on new additions. And so they showed you know, how schools can be looked after in a really imaginative way and adapted you know, for, 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 for modern purposes. But you know, so many schools are, are equally are suffering, especially we found in the colliery villages in Nottinghamshire, where they are the main landmark, often the only landmark. And when when that goes, uh, or, or especially when uh, the, the money is made available uh, for, for a new, uh, new school, uh, you know, the old school is suddenly demolished when it could have another, another use. Well, I will draw to an end there, but uh, uh, churches and uh, private houses perhaps we can discuss uh, in the next half hour. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Marcus. So now we're moving on to um, Vicky Martin. Vicky has been Chief Executive of the Heartlands Trust since 2011. Heartland, which was part of the Cornish Mining World Heritage Site, is a project that's seen a, the, a former mining site in Cool transformed into a new cultural and recreational landscape based on Cornish mining history. It's a £35 million project, which this year won first place in the best planning for natural and built heritage category at the Royal Town Planning Institute Award. So congratulations for that. Prior to Heartlands, Vicky, uh, Vicky had great experience launching other heritage visitor attractions, including Wollaton Hall and Nottingham, and the Steam Railway and Expert Gardens um, in Hampshire. She was also a former director of Wentworth Cattle and Stainburg Park Heritage Trust in Yorkshire. And her rhythmically named paper is called Movers, Shakers, and Collaborators. Oh, insights from an operator. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to say I'm delighted to have been invited here to speak um, at this important event. At first, I was a little bemused as to what I could offer the debate, um, particularly uh, since I've been programmed alongside some real heavyweights of the uh, heritage sector. Um, I'm not a heritage expert, um, but as an operator, um, I have been involved with a number of major restoration projects, and I hope that by sharing the stories of two of these, um, that I can provide some insights to feed the discussions. Okay, um, I've been asked to consider the following questions in my presentation. Who has responsibility for protecting our heritage? Should the impetus for protecting our heritage ultimately come from people or be imposed by government? What is the role of leading voluntary bodies, communities and private owners in heritage protection? 
And I thought it would be interesting to consider the roles of different stakeholder groups in protecting our heritage using major restoration projects, primarily Heartlands and Wentworth, as case studies. And both of these are inspirational projects because of their scale and ambition and what's actually been achieved on the ground. By telling their stories, um, the initial drivers, what's been achieved and importantly how, I hope to inform the discussions about the roles that different stakeholder <coughs> groups might play in the future. So we'll start with Heartlands. Um, and Heartlands, as has already been mentioned, is a £35 million regeneration project in Poole. It was actually led by Lorm Cornwall Council. And the idea was to transform a derelict 19-acre industrial site in Poole into a landmark destination for visitors and a thriving community hub for local residents. The area had been dragged down uh, following the collapse of mining and is one of the poorest communities in the UK with multiple indices of deprivation. Over the years, the site had been subjected to vandalism and suffered a number of arson attacks. The project is a mixed-use development centred around the restoration of Robinson Shaft Tin Mine, which is a Grade Two star uh, complex, and the creation of new buildings to provide visitor community facilities, together with commercial and residential units. The site was developed really as a catalyst for wider regeneration and not just a re as a restoration project uh, in itself. And private sector developers have already started construction um, of 140 homes on a site adjacent site to the north of the site, um, on a plot to the north of the site. There's also a planning application in for two further developments to the um, west and the south. So what we've done over the last couple of years is transform an industrial wasteland into what we now position as a cultural playground. And this is a picture that was taken at a festival that we held this year uh, called Kerno Fest, where we celebrated the, the best of Cornish culture. And uh, as you can see, it's a, a thriving site now. It's very well visited. Uh, we launched in April 2012. It was launched by the Heartlands Trust, which is a social enterprise that was set up to operate the site um, once it had been completed. And we've welcomed over 400,000 visitors uh, since we opened in April 2012. So the level of community engagement in this project has been phenomenal and really uh, surpassed expectations. Um, we were actually designed as a gateway to the Cornish Mining World Heritage, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Okay, what we've done is essentially give the historic mine buildings a new, new lease of life. We've brought them back, given them a new use. So the uh, historic buildings uh, now house state-of-the-art World Heritage exhibitions. Uh, we tell the story of Cornish mining in a number of ways. And we also use the site as a gateway to signpost other attractions within the wider um, Cornish Mining World Heritage landscape. Uh, we've converted the former carpenter's workshop and forge into uh, the Red River Cafe. And this has been um, very well received by the visitors. Um, we've um, taken great care to retain the original character of the building. So, um, the original collections of machinery um, that were found in the, in the building have been left in situ and uh, the visitors are able to enjoy a pasty literally sitting next to a circular saw. It certainly Dangerous. takes um, themed restaurants to a new extreme, um, but it's been very well received. Um, we've even done things like um, the insulation has been put on the outside of the building rather than in the inside so that you can we could retain the original shed-like sort of feel of the structure as you walk in. We also tell the story of Cornish mining not just through the collection of mine buildings and the artefacts on site, but also through the diaspora gardens that have been created. And these are a series of gardens which were uh, themed on countries that the Cornish miners went. These are the countries where the Cornish miners took their expertise, um, where they settled, um, these are the countries where they brought back seed, which then populated the gardens of the great houses that were built with the profits of mining. So there's a really nice story there. So we tell the story of Cornish mining through the buildings, through the collections, and also through the plants. Uh, as part of the project, um, we wanted to provide community facilities. And we have fabulous um, Chai and Bobble, which is House of the People in Cornish, which has been created 
It's a massive hall and we've also got a number of smaller meeting rooms. These have been done to a very high spec and also serve the corporate market and we're doing extremely well uh, in terms of conferencing. That's providing an important revenue stream for us now that we're open. There's also a number of live work units on site. We've got 15 um, workshops which are available to um, creatives, uh, designer makers um, and artists. And we've also got 19 apartments. Uh, again, these provide revenue streams for the site to underpin the sustainability of the, uh, the, the free aspects. Um, and for the little visitors, we have the biggest free adventure playground in Cornwall, if not the southwest. And this was themed on the mining heritage of the site. So again, we've tried to keep everything um, as uh, close to the, to the core subject of the site as possible. The playground was designed with the help of children. Um, so the playground was for children, but also designed by children. And it was local children from Paul Academy that actually helped uh, design this. Um, as has been mentioned, um, Partners has won numerous awards for design, uh, planning excellence and sustainability. And uh, we've had quite a good run this year, as you can see. <laughs> so how did we make this happen? Um, well, it didn't happen overnight. Uh, there was actually a 15 year gestation period um, and it was very much driven by the local community. So I think Heartlands really shows um, what can be achieved when you've got um, the desire uh, by the local community to actually want to effect change. There were originally three working groups um, that were all working uh, within the area looking at different aspects. So there was a Robinson's working group which was made up of Kerry District Council, both officers and elected members, and also mining experts, and their core interest was, was what to do with the mine and the former mine buildings. There was also a regeneration group for the parish, and there were representatives from the parish, district councils, business people, and also community organisations. And there was an open space group as well, and this was parish council-led, um, but with public community organisations involved, and they were looking at the lack of open space and play equipment. The one common denominator between these three groups was a local councillor, and he has since become the chairman of the Hartlands Trust, and has been sort of involved with this right through, right through from the beginning. Um, so in 2002, strike three was quite a critical point because these three working groups merged, and um, and it became possible to develop sort of a single vision for the site. Um, I've listed here some of the critical milestones in terms of Hartman's development, and I think that the biggest single uh, critical milestone was really in 2005 when Big Lottery launched the Living Landmarks programme, and this was uh, sort of an enormous pot of gold which was um, available. There were four projects funded nationally, 350 applications, so that just goes to show the level of interest in this scheme. Um, Hartman's was one of the four winners, and it really en enabled the, the dream to become real and was a, uh, yeah, the, the, the biggest single sort of milestone really uh, in terms of the development. Another critical milestone was 2006 um, and it was at that point that select mining districts in Cornwall and Devon were inscribed as a World Heritage Site. Uh, it's actually the largest World Heritage Site in the UK. It's not terribly well known because it's one of the more recent ones, but it spans 20,000 hectares across Devon and Cornwall. Um, and um, by 2007, uh, the Big Lottery Fund Award um, was made. Uh, this was for £22.3 million. Pounds. And with a lot like that, it really gives an opportunity to transform the community. Uh, once you've got one piece of the funding jigsaw in place, it then becomes easier to build on that and pull together the funding package. And Homes and Communities Agency um, came on board, uh, mainly providing the land, uh, but to a total value of £7 million. Pounds. Cornwall Council, uh, £3 million. And because it's an area of uh, deprivation, we were eligible to get European Convergence funding through the ERDF, and there was £2.8 million. So the total pot, development pot, became £35 million. Um, the next couple of years, there was detailed design development and enabling works, and then a couple of year construction period. Um, Wentworth Castle and Gardens is the second one that I wanted to look at. This is a 600 acre grade one listed landscape in Barnsley. 
It's got 26 listed buildings, monuments and follies, three national plant collections. In total, £20 million has been raised by the Wentworth Castle Trust since 2005, and this has been spent creating new visitor facilities and also restoring monuments and the landscape. This is the Long Barn, and it shows you here some before and after pictures. Um, this is the hub of the visitor facilities where you've got the cafe, shop, admissions point. There's also facilities for conferencing, again, to generate revenue to support the sustainability of the site. Stainborough Castle um, is a romantic folly, and you can see before and afters there. Um, Corinthian Temple, Grade 2 Star Gun Rim, Grade 2 Star Rotunda. Um, this was uh, restored in a, in a couple of different phases. Um, and finally, the conservatory. Uh, this is being restored as we speak and should be finalised next month, should be finished next month, um, where it will be relaunched. The conservatory really ran, rose to fame and won the heart of the nation the BBC TV programme Restoration, where it, became, where it came third in the very first series. It took another sort of eight years, 12, eight, nine years to actually pull the funding package together. Uh, but certainly, it won the hearts of, of local people and enjoys tremendous community support. So how did that one happen? Well, that was a 30-year gestation period, and uh, that one started in sort of the mid-70s, and there were movers and shakers lobbying within the heritage arena, which highlighted Wentworth as an endangered site of national importance, and it was first highlighted in the Destruction of the Country House exhibition at the V&A, which we've already heard about, through the Save Britain's Heritage campaign, and also within the sort of heritage arena, um, people like the Bjorgen Group and the Global History Society English Heritage um, joined the lobby in the mid-80s, but it wasn't until the early 90s that the landowner Barnsley uh, Metropolitan Council recognised the need to restore the gardens, and primarily this was a desire to transfer liability. Um, it, its initial highly ambitious plans were knocked back um, in the early 90s, um, and it later on there was reborn, sort of, um, as it became a key element within the remaking Barnsley regeneration strategy. Over the last ten years, um, various regional and national agents all pushed for a workable solution. Um, and in 2002, the Wentworth Castle and the Sanger Park Heritage Trust was formed. This was very much under the advice of the HLF, and they actually funded the project director post, who then developed the successful bid um, for phase one of the restoration. And it was at this point, with the formation of the trust, that the ownership of buildings and gardens were transferred to the trust. In 2004, the Vernon Wentworth family donated the wider historic park, and this then reunited the house and the park and created a more viable project for a fledgling trust. Phase one, 16 million, funding partners, main one heritage lottery fund, also English Heritage, Barnsley Council, Yorkshire Forward, with European money, um, death for natural England, um, because of the landscape, South Yorkshire Forest, etc. Um, in 2007, the project opened as a visitor attraction. Um, there was then phase two, which is currently underway, um, funded by, again, HLF, um, ER, EH, ERDF and Country Houses Foundation. And um, this is what all revolves around the conservatory, the restoration of the conservatory <coughs> will open next month. A couple of mini projects as well um, have been funded um, along the way. In terms of conclusions, uh, the conclusions I came to doing this is that there, to make these things happen on the ground, there's always movers and shakers, and these tend to be the catalysts, and they're the ones with the ambition, the vision, they're the drivers of change. And these movers and shakers can either come from the local community, which is very much the case of, big, uh, of the um, Heartlands project, which was very much driven by the, the local community, or it could come from the heritage communities, such as, uh, which is uh, the case with Wentworth. Um, but it's not until everybody starts working together that actually, um, in collaborating, that comes the success. And, um, and what I've also found is that local communities need the expertise of experts and also local government. Um, and one thing that has helped us um, in the past has been a joined up approach to funding. Certainly with Wentworth, it was a lot easier to pull together the funding packages because a lot of the funders were actually talking to each other and had actually agreed what the priorities were for that region. Um, which made it possible to, to actually achieve what's been achieved on the ground. And the impact of the lottery, I can't underestimate, um, over underestimate the, the impact of the lottery in terms of empowering communities on the ground. All of a sudden, it has become possible to make these dreams become <coughs> real. And um, it's yeah, absolutely transformed the, the environment that we're working in. And I think, just to conclude, we've all got a role to play, and we all share a collective responsibility. Thank you very much, Vicky. Now we move on to our last speaker today or after this session.
and Alex Hale. One's an academic at the University of Edinburgh. Alex has worked for the past 13 years um, as a very experienced archaeological investigator at the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Scotland. His role there has given him a real opportunity to survey, interpret, research, and record archaeological sites and landscapes across the length and breadth of Scotland. His range of experience, however, goes far beyond his own in-depth understanding of Scotland's historic environment. He's a big believer in the importance of sharing his understanding with others. And Alex has long recognized the value of connecting with people as a key way to grow their love and support and heritage. And that's the theme for his paper today, which is entitled Share Nicely, How We Approach a Knowledge-Based Understanding of Heritage to Underpin Our Protection Responsibilities. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you. Can everyone hear me at the back? And I won't keep you long because I know we're getting towards lunchtime. Mm -hmm. Now, why me? Why did you choose me? Uh, I'm a Brummy working in Scotland for the past 20 years. Uh, what can I bring to your table? Well, I hope I'll bring some, a slightly different insight from north of the border, but nevertheless one that I hope I can share with you and we can exchange experiences. So for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to illustrate how state institutions, third sex sector organisations, voluntary bodies, groups and individuals all play a role in the responsibility for the protection of heritage. So everyone and no one have responsibility for the protection of our heritage, but it's about choice. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a number of examples of protective measures that have been undertaken over the past few years. I want to also consider how state institutions can empower people through, and you'll pardon my use of language here, knowledge exchange. And I think that is crucial. Exchange, sharing as well. And hence we can then develop new models of shared responsibilities. In order to understand my position, I think you should know a little bit about me. As Ingrid said, I'm an archaeological investigator with the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Scotland. Trips off the tongue, doesn't it? <laughs> we are a non-departmental public body. That is important, and I'll come back to it later. We were originally Crown servants, and we are now public servants. Over my past 13 years, I've surveyed, recorded, interpreted, and researched extensive tracts of the Scottish landscape, everything from stone circles to ruined farm buildings, and everything in between. The work's fascinating. The range of archaeological landscapes and monuments is world-class, and that is undoubted. But since I started my job, I've gone from working with a small team of experts, and I do class myself as an expert, but that's only because I got a doctorate in front of my name and a bit of graffiti after it. But what we've done since then, over the 13 years, is we have shifted our position. And we've gone from being small and insular, and we've begun to work in partnership with other heritage organisations and with people with an interest in the historic landscapes of Scotland. This experience has allowed me to see how different people and bodies choose particular roles and responsibility for the protection of heritage. So, I see protection of heritage in three general forms, and I am generalising, so you can pick me up on it later. Firstly, hard protection that consists of fences, walls and barriers. Secondly, legal protection within which states develop schedules, lists, protected designations. And third level of protection, which I think is the thing I want to focus on, is through capturing knowledge about the past, how we create, maintain and share that knowledge. So the first form of protection, of hard barriers, is one which humans have been using for thousands of years. We know this. The concept is based upon building a physical barrier that can be both symbolic and practical and prevents people getting in, getting out. It just stops the flow, it changes the flow, it shifts things. And this can be exemplified by defences around hill forts, 
various imposing walls found around the world. This great one, of course, that Richard Hingley here knows all about, and most of us do as well, and it's symbolic as much as physical. These physical barriers over time have become protected by the positioning fences around physical defences, uh, railings, and we put other measures to prevent people and livestock from damaging them, and right so. These protective measures can ensure the preservation of the monument, but at the same time can restrict access to it. It is this tension between protection and access that lies at the heart of our involvement in heritage. Protective measures have now become advanced, so although they place a protective barrier around an object, the barrier is permeable, opaque in this case. This is exemplified here by the, what you could call, incarceration of a Pictish symbol stone within a glass house. It's a shame Pictish symbol stones don't throw stones. The glass prevents further damage to the fragile features and at the same time allows people to see the intricately carved stones. But is this good enough? Secondly, legal protection over the past 130 years or so has been drawn up and passed through Parliament and with the aim of primarily enabling ministers and their agents to protect ancient monuments, landscapes, buildings, gardens and design landscapes and most re recently for us in Scotland, historic sea wrecks. In Scotland we now have legislation for historic marine protected areas which is designed to protect underwater cultural heritage. This was introduced as part of the Marine Scotland Act as recently as 2010. Under this, and under this latest law, a newly discovered 17th century wreck in the coastal waters off Sutherland has just been protected, which is a great thing, a really great thing, and all of a sudden a new piece of legislation. This is quite unusual, I think, and maybe a difference between England and Scotland. This act in Scotland deals with the issues specific to the underwater environment, which is subject to particular pressures from development, aquaculture, and marine exploitation companies. So we are addressing this head on. So that's my second approach to lead to protection. Third, the one I want to focus on the most, is the protection of the knowledge and understanding of heritage and what places or objects mean to people. That is one of the most exciting and challenging, but ultimately rewarding and resilient methods to protect our heritage. Notice I didn't use the word sustainable. I'm using resilient here. This, this approach is tied up in the concept of shared responsibility that is informed by different people, some of whom provide information, others of whom curate that information, and those that share, enable, and empower others to appreciate archaeology, architecture, heritage, you name it. This is not a new concept, but one which can be exemplified by some bloke, Herodotus. His writing in his history of Herodotus, translated back by Rawlinson in 1996, brilliant piece of work, starts with the line, and I won't say it in ancient Greek, these are the researches of Herodotus, which he publishes in the hope of thereby preserving from decay the remembrance of what men have done. Now, notwithstanding literary criticism of the nature of his writing, Herodotus has clearly stated that by writing something down and importantly making it publicly accessible, it can contribute to our understanding of the past. This is a crucial and sometimes forgotten part of our responsibility towards heritage protection. Today, knowledge exchange can form a collective, protective approach and is one that is based around knowledge, information, stories, recollections, and most importantly, the sharing I will use a number of examples to demonstrate how vital knowledge exchange is in recognising heritage protection responsibilities. These examples demonstrate the impact of working within a knowledge exchange network which focuses on heritage. How long have I got? It's all right? You've got about seven minutes. Great. So, three examples of knowledge sharing. 
Earlier I mentioned that I thought protection of heritage had to increase focus on improving and sharing knowledge and our understanding of pasts. So how do we achieve this? Well, we're already doing many, many things, and we've already heard things that Nikki has exemplified this morning, and Stephen as well, and others. But I do think that we need to increase support for our local groups and national organisations and societies because they are the ones that form the backbone of our heritage sector and are part of the connected community that makes up the many different strands of heritage interests. These groups are full of fascinating, knowledgeable, and enthusiastic people who are passionate about heritage. I'm talking about you lot and all the people out there that we get the chance to work with as well. And it is this passion that delivers impact far beyond their job, our job descriptions. So, here are the examples of knowledge exchange work that empowers people to share responsibility of heritage knowledge. The first really shifted my view of responsibility and also of who I am and where I fit within the heritage sector. So, the Discover Butte Landscape Partnership Scheme was a community-driven project run by the community. They were responsible for the project and they asked us at the Royal Commission, a national body of survey and recording, to come and help them. Butte lies just off to the west of Glasgow, beautiful island, and from 2009 to 2012, the island was the focus of a Heritage Lottery Fund landscape partnership scheme. It only cost 2.8 million quid of everyone going down and doing a lottery scratching. 2.8 million quid. It involved over 3,000 volunteer days. And we were asked by the people of the island to undertake a resurvey of the archaeological landscape of the whole island, which we did with locals and visitors. So we spent 13 weeks together over two years and formed a survey team of Arkham staff, locals and anyone who wanted to come and join us. Over the course of the survey, the locals led us to sites that we had records of in our National Monuments database. We call it Canmore now. Um, and so we had records of some site and they took us to new sites as well. Collectively, we discussed age, form, function, condition, whilst we were there on site, and we formed a knowledge exchange partnership model. Everyone in the team was a valued member. As a result of the work, Butte now has one of the most up-to-date and enhanced sites and monuments record, which is maintained by us through our online database, CAM. Over a thousand site records were enhanced and improved and up-to-date, and we that was through partially seven, over 700 site visits as well, hence the 13 weeks on the island. These records for the sites were created and updated by all team members so they can now see their contributions online in the national database. But this is only part of the work. The point is that through this joint working approach, the responsibility for the checking and creating of heritage knowledge was a shared process based on local knowledge, those people we worked with, and national expertise, and it was that mix together that worked so well. So what, I hear you say. Well, for starters, through workshops requested by the islands over the course of the project, they now know an awful lot more about the planning system in Scotland, how to create sites in a local and national historic environment records, which gives them status in the planning system. They're also au fait with the workings of a national monuments database and how they can contribute to it. But more importantly, the people who participated in the work got to see the landscape of their island in a different light through the eyes of others and they shared knowledge and experiences based on the island's physical heritage remains. They now have a strong set of skills to understand and recognise what they value as heritage. They know who to consult when it comes to the development of patrol and they are actively researching their heritage. So to conclude that example, because the recognition, recording and understanding of the island's archaeology was undertaken through a partnership approach with local people at its core, this has led to a collective responsibility being developed, which empowers the islanders and others in all matters that affect their heritage. The caveat, of course, is that it does take about 50% more work time working with new people. That's very rewarding, but it should be remembered. 50%, okay? Add that to your budgets, guys. 
my time? Two minutes. Two minutes. Second example is an AHRC funded, there we go, hit the switch, AHRC funded research project that I've been recently involved with. You may not have heard of Mr. Seal's Garden, but it was an AHRC funded Connected Communities pilot demonstrator project. The aims of the project included embedding research skills in communities by focusing on local food heritage in Liverpool. We worked with local people to research and understand local food systems in the past, currently, and what that could do to inform future directions. The project involved oral historians, archivists, sociologists, archaeologists, designers, coders, creative artists. The results range from skill sharing to outputs such as workshops, recipes, a geofenced app that only works in Liverpool, and a Google mashup, map mashup. The main impact, however, was the knowledge exchange between professional researchers and local researchers. It was this contribution of local and national perspectives that appears to have led to impact beyond the life of the project and out with the project design. For example, I know a Wallasey allotment keeper who's now sourced a local tomato that they hadn't known for ages that was grown in the area. Cavendish Perfection was very popular. She successfully now sourced the seeds, grown it, tasted it, and now people around the world are saying, send me some seeds of your Cavendish Perfection because we love it so much. So finally, to finish this section about examples, about creating and empowering, I want to bring you up to date with a third example, which is, as you know, about what's happening north of the border. Uh, right now at the bottom here, the Royal Commission and the uh, Historic Scotland, we are in the process of transition to merge to form a new heritage body of Scotland, which will, I stress, be a non-departmental public body. So it will be at arm's length from government. So this presents opportunities for new partnerships to be formed and new heritage frameworks and networks to be developed. As part of this, we are developing a research programme that considers how people have interacted with a national river system in the past, how they do today, and how they could in the future. And a lot of the things that uh, we're planning on doing fit very nicely about transformative knowledge generation at its core, and it's designed to use evidence and knowledge about the past to inform and transform our current and future practices. And it fits quite well with the care for the future core as well. So to conclude, I believe that there must be shared, sometimes contested, but always an open and accessible knowledge base at the core of understanding of heritage is uh, its protection and the range of responsibilities towards that heritage. So this is about creating the archive, the inventory. The flip side of this, of course, is that shared responsibility of protection is also shared responsibility of loss. And just as we rejoice in the success of understanding something, then saving and protecting it, we must collectively grieve in the shared loss of heritage. So the challenge is to develop the negotiating skills that enable us to consider current stakeholders' opinions and by using our past experiences as experts to propose potential future scenarios and then undertake collective knowledge-based protective measures. But the real challenge is for us in the profession to have the ability to be flexible, considerate and prepared to reconsider our positions regularly. We've done well recently in, the part, in parts of the heritage sector is changing, and our roles are changing from gatekeeper to enabler. Ahead lies the challenge for us in the sector to enable the state to recognise how important heritage really is, how it can provide the backdrop for social change, for the good, and how, through appropriate funding, we can use heritage knowledge exchange as a fulcrum for new approaches to responsibility. To do this, we must continue to improve our access to archives from national bodies to local societies. We need to grow our social networks through digital and analogue processes that combine short and long-term partners with newfound colleagues. And finally, and it is finally, national governments need to invest in social processes that enable knowledge exchange between us all. For we are all experts and amateurs in one field or another. And I remember something that Paul mentioned yesterday about do these experts want to become facilitators? Well, I've gone through that transition and I'm still here. I'm still standing. Uh, it is, and it is through that, through that social approach that creates a much stronger, resilient form of protection and one that strengthens social bonds, builds partnerships, engenders learning relationships and binds people from different places to contribute to the understanding, sharing and caring of the remains of the past for the future. Thank you.
too far into much, so I'm, I'm not going to do much in the way of, sort of summing up um, what came out of those four very, very interesting papers that we've heard today. Um, I think we've heard a range of perspectives, um, and there was some shared points in common. There was something about the importance of the individual, something about the importance of collaboration, and something about the importance of practical solutions, not least the importance of being income generating sort of projects. I'm not sure we talked about enough about the importance of funding. We consider the role of expertise, passion, commitment, but we could say more about money. Whose job is it to pay for all of this? And should we be accepting in Lloyd's words the end of the years of government involvement? So it might be something we want to pick up. But actually, I want to just throw over the floor to you guys and say, are there any questions for our speakers? I thought those were four really interesting sort of uh, contrasting papers, but I, I just want to ask about something um, about uh, knowledge exchange. I mean, I, I think those examples you quoted are really interesting, particularly the one you used. What sort of came into my mind, I mean, I, I have a history uh, working in Scotland, and I, I know the way the Royal Commission has operated over the years in Scotland. Um, I just wonder, um, what, to what extent is the knowledge exchange work you're doing with the community on Utes actually challenging the sort of um, recording standards and the categories into which you're placing the sites you're looking at? And I mean, if, if that hasn't really occurred, I mean, this is a sort of top down question, I suppose, in a way. But obviously, what you're doing is fully engaging those people. But, um, do you think in the future, if you continue doing similar projects, they may, may actually feed back into the sort of standards that uh, people like archaeologists and historical landscape people use to analyse the, uh, and understand the landscape? Was that a question? <laughs> um, I think I understand. You're talking partially about the source, terms and recognition of heritage, and understanding what is a square barrow and not a palm clearance, aren't you? Yeah, I'm talking about the sort of categories that uh, the Royal Commission and archaeologists more generally sometimes place sites into. I, I'm not, I mean, it's not like it's trying to undermine or attack what you're doing. I, one of the things I think we have been discussing is how much engagement actually can challenge our own professional knowledge. So I think you're doing I, I think that's an issue where you're, whether you're doing with historic landscapes or buildings, I should say. I'm not trying to reduce this entirely to archaeology. Perhaps that's complicated a bit further. So I, I, I'm asking you as a professional, you know, the sort of professional things you do when you analyze the core of the landscape are being challenged, or whether it's just the operations through which you undertake those activities and the funding of those That's activities. right. And I think you've identified the potential tension between we have a role to play um, inventorising the historic landscape and lumps and bumps across. But we didn't find it was a uh, it was particularly a tension at all when we were working with people because it um, enriched the debate and it challenged us to question why we were making these decisions and having to back them up. And that's how it worked quite well. But we did have a kind of all right, expertise, and we did have a breadth of knowledge. And if you added up the kind of the team members' experience, you know, a couple of surveyors, Ian Parker and, and a couple of colleague, and someone like Strat Halliday, who's got you know 742 years of experience of field monuments in Scotland, and you add them up, and yes, there is a breadth of knowledge within the team, uh, and we have to maintain that breadth of knowledge. But it, the important thing is the sharing of the knowledge. And the way in which you do undertake that share and how you have that discussion on site and how you have this back and forth about whether <coughs> this is a pair, a pair of square cairns, a kelp kilns that have been robbed, or, or clearance and nothing more as well. And yes, okay, at the end of the day, I'm the one who creates the site record in Canmore in the National Monuments database. But if there is a contested issue, that can be between yourself and myself and within the team and elsewhere. We will go back and we'll look at the site. And yes, we get it wrong. We know this from excavation. 
but we have to call it a something as well. And what we've now done is opened up much more as well as the source to our modern database, so people can add new sites to it, they can challenge other sites as well. And don't forget, there's always a little box, it's called alternate name, you can always give it another name if you don't agree as well. I answer the question? I think so. <laughs> Great. Can, can Crispin have a question? Thanks very much. <coughs> Crispin Truman, Churches Conservation Trust. My question is what is the role of national bodies in an era of localism? And linked to that, what is the right level of public funding? in an area where public funding is going down and down, assuming it's not zero. Um, I think, uh, I, I, I want to give a bit of an answer to that from what I think. Um, obviously, knowledge sharing is part of it, and Alex has started to talk about that. But I also think national bodies in an area where we will not turn up with loads of capacity and expertise, um, we're not a nationalisation model anymore, it's about catalyzing, it's about brokering the right package of support, it's about identifying the weaknesses in communities and individuals, because individuals won't be able to do it alone always, um, and filling those gaps in the right way. And, and yes, sometimes bringing expertise, and yes, sometimes bringing funding, but usually match funding, targeted funding, um, to make a whole package of support work. Um, so that's my thoughts on it anyway, if you're interested in what yours are too. And on what the right level of public funding, nobody talks about that. We all sort of agree that public funding is going down and down. Um, I don't think you can do without saying, I think you've got a national monument in the middle of the field, you always need some public money. But does anyone think about what it is the right level of public funding? Very interesting question. Okay, again, Steve's going to start um, with that. I can't offer you uh, a level, but what I do say is that um, I agree with Lloyd, the government's going to be smaller in heritage in the future. Check the um, the UK debt time bomb website this morning, and if you've ever looked at it, it's a rolling picture of the UK debt, and it now stands at 1.2 trillion and lots of digits after it. So this economic recovery, you know, it, it will smooth things out for a while. But the long term is that we're going to face a smaller government, smaller government expenditure, and that's why I think it's a sort of key issue to think about what you, the sector want from your state heritage services in, in the future because they will be smaller and there will be there will be a conflict on priorities of things that you, you value, different services that you value. Um, that's why I think the debate on the role of the experts is an interesting one. How much, how much expertise do we need to keep the sector ticking over? And this model is I'm sure the right one in the way of the future, but all of the all of the examples we heard have tended to involve um, someone from the government funded institution providing some expertise along the way. So I can't give you a figure. Hope is less than nothing. Oh, <laughs> ignore them. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm such a pessimist. I'm trying to speak. I'd like to come in here because I, I think the amount of public sector funding that's available is almost a bit of a red herring because actually, from my experience, the projects that I've been involved with, the lion's share of the money has actually come from lottery sources. It's come from big lottery, it's come from heritage lottery. And if you look at the Wentworth restoration and what's been achieved over the last 10 years, actually 20 million pounds worth of restoration, probably only half a million of it has come from English heritage. Um, so actually, I would see the role as more importantly, provision of expertise and advice rather than cash flowing or putting money in, from my experience and from the perspective that I have. Does anybody else want to pick up on this question of funding? Because I think it's, it's a kind of interesting one before we move on. Yeah, I did want to just raise a thought. Um, what has come out of yesterday, um, is it yesterday evening and today, is the lottery it keeps coming up again and again. And again, and it's doing fantastic work, and has been said it has transformed the landscape of what has been possible and the way people manage to engage. But I'm just slightly worried that a message that may come out of these two days is that kind of in the future the lottery can sort it all out, the lottery can pay for it all. Um, and there are areas of activity which I suspect the lottery 
will not want to pay for possibly and might not be the best organisation to pay for and that's a lot of the, the sort of nitty gritty, the, the boring bits, the keeping records up to date and more than anything else perhaps the policing of some of the legislation around protecting heritage, the, the unpopular bits if you like when the man from the ministry has to say no. Um, and in the setting standards, producing documentation which explains to people why these decisions are being made. And I'm just slightly concerned that uh, government may be thinking that they can hide off all their financial responsibilities for heritage to the lottery, which seems to be this, you know, film pot. And I don't think that's the case. And I don't imagine the lottery people are thinking this is the case either. So I just think we just need to be a little careful about what message comes out from these two days as to that solution to government people within the government may be looking to find as a sort of approved solution. You know. Thanks. I, and I think that's interesting. It's, it, you know, maybe the question we should be asking ourselves is not what is the right level of government funding, but what is the right role for government funding? And what are those market failures that we need, or do we need, public money to help us correct? There was a, so at the back here. Thank you, Chris Scarlett, Cardiff, Cardiff, Cardiff University. I have a question for Marcus and um, Marcus, one of the messages I took from the your talk was that there is an important role for um, either appropriate and sensitive commercial development of deceased buildings um, and a very important role for the private, the private responsible private owner. Um, but what I took from physics was that actually in those exemplary uh, regeneration projects, the almost the entire funding effort came from the public purse or the public administrative purse in one way or another. Um, so I would try to move the debate away from state funding through the other one or two agencies um, which have heritage responsibility towards the broader question of is there any viable alternative to the public purse in its more general sense um, in these issues that we face. Marcus seemed to suggest that there might be if the, the uh, examples you gave appear to be wholly dependent on more public funding or whatever. Can I ask your views on that? Uh, well, the, um, the hospital I raised, uh, that, that had expel, had a big injection through English heritage, but a lot of the other hospital commercials have been done on a, a commercial basis. And so they haven't required a lot of historic buildings money. So I think you know, there are many examples of things which can be done uh, through uh, commercial investment. I mean, obviously, it's, got to be, it's very important that they're controlled so that they did. Uh, result in the despoilation of the site or inappropriate development around it. But I think, you know, whether, you know, spending country house conversions, whether conversions of market buildings, hospital buildings, there is a real opportunity for, for private commercial investment to do some of the work. Do you want to respond? Yeah. Um, I think um, in an ideal world, um, things would be commercially viable. Unfortunately, the reality is that they're not. And it also varies from geographical area to geographical area. And the projects that I've been involved with are both areas where there are multiple de indices of deprivation. And effectively, the state has had to step in because the market forces have failed. And it's been necessary to have that level of state intervention to actually affect transformation and change. And if it was left to the, the private sector and the commercial world, it wouldn't happen. Um, and I think it's very different talking about restoring um, some of maybe former hospitals in London and the South East to the former industrial cities of the North and, um, and Cornwall as well, which has its own problems. Thanks. We have a sick group around here. <laughs> what Marcus was saying, which is that um, some years ago, the British Heritage provided the government with a template, which was going to be statutory, which was that um, the local government was supposed to actually have a terrier over their listed uh, buildings, and then following on from that, there was supposed to be a statutory framework of concomial repair for those, something which slipped away a little bit of bonfire of our regulation, unfortunately, over there. And I want to leave that third and secondly, which is this business about validation of our conservation um, and inclusion. Um, some years ago, I remember going to a conference at VNA and someone from Italy was talking about the numbers and numbers that they had in the essential world. But what they were doing was actually using local communities completely um, you know, untechnically uh, um, uh, 
payment at that time, uh, certainly not academically or in any other way qualified, but they were going to be put in charge of the restoration, cleaning, etc., of extraordinarily fragile monuments. It was beginning to take a breath around the room. And the Italians were saying, no, we just don't have money, we've got too many, um, and that's what we have to do. And I, I mean, there's a bigger story about that, but linking through to, in a sense, the set of the thing in the um, I think there is actually going to be that challenge coming uh, with uh, the monuments from the First and Second World War, where there are going to be grants available. And I'm just interested in this business about the fact that you know, I suspect most people would have this business about pattern of age, Lincoln, uh, perhaps you, you don't see the letters as clearly as you did of, of you know, uh, people, of, of family members. We'll be, all be quite relaxed about the fact that in order to build inclusion from our local communities, we will allow them to actually get their felt tip pens out and start lettering in um, and doing various other things because it, it gives them a sense of involvement um, in one aspect of um, antiquity. Any the panel want to respond to that comment? Right, well maybe we'll bundle it up with some of the other comments that are coming. So if you wouldn't mind passing your mic forward to that gentleman who's been waiting for quite a while. Just go back to the to Frank Frank Castle architectural history practice. Just go back to the issue which has been touched on once or twice, but the, word, the dreaded words enabling development and marketing have been used in those two words. Uh, certainly, most of the recent, I think Lloyd this morning said that in some ways the actual publicity building set issues have to a great extent been solved. We don't have huge numbers of demolitions these days, but most of the recent cases that I've been involved in have been involved in the setting. There are going to be some buildings which, because their settings are so sensitive, are never going to be, their problems are not going to be solved by enabling development. Uh, so there's got to be funding from somewhere, and the lottery can't always do it. But the other issue is I think that just as the government is, is reducing funding for uh, the heritage directly, it's also loosening the planning regulations. And it does seem to me there is a serious danger uh, that despite the English heritage guidelines, which have been extremely useful, uh, there will be increasing difficulty in, in, in protecting the setting of historical buildings. I think I agree. We have we have a real challenge around the setting. Um, the lady here who wanted to ask the question. It's one from Marcus, really. Yeah. Yeah, well, obviously, protecting the setting uh, is very important, and uh, often, you know, enabling the development can simply be a lever to increase the value of the site, and the, the, the money generated by the enabling development goes to the developer rather than the historic building set. So, that is pretty fundamental. But on this point about uh, uh, areas you know, of, of, of economic uh, difficulty, uh, the same is doing a lot of work in Liverpool there, but the typical townhouses there. And the problem there is that the local authority thinks that the only way of getting any money is from the public sector. They don't actually accept that there are people queuing up who'd like to buy these houses, but then invest their own money in it. And uh, they, had, they offered 20 houses for a pound. They had 3,000 inquiries. Uh, people who wanted homes, they take on these houses. They haven't given away one yet. You know. <laughs> there are a lot of people that actually want to spend some money on heritage in small ways as well as big ways. Can you hear me? Is this a shot? Yes. Um, two things. Um, I think there will always be a shortfall in funding the where funding needs to come in from somewhere, like the lottery, public sector, or whatever. But in a way, doing up buildings is the sexy side of the business. We can see a result, we can see an improved building. It's something that you know, communities can get together to do a project, they can see an end result. Thinking of what Perenz has said, there is a very unsexy side of the building, which Alex has touched on, is the, is the side of the process which Alex has touched on. It's the regulatory side. It's the fact that somebody has to actually do the development control, the development management, whatever we call it, uh, somebody has to be stopping the development that affects the setting of the building. Somebody has to be making those very hard decisions which cut across what government actually wants to see. It's not seen as um, enabling, it's not seen as sexy, it's not seen as forward looking. It's the big where we have to actually say no. And that will still need funding. And that's the bit where the local authorities are losing their conservation offices, they're losing their staff, where each heritage is being stripped of the expertise that used to go around and be able to say, actually, this is what the effect of this will be. This is what, these are what our policies are. This is what, 
how this cuts across these policies. This is what the result would be if we actually carry on doing this kind of development. The sort of boring understanding of areas, which really, really protects not the special places, not the areas that attract money, but the day-to-day -day places we all live in, we work in, we visit, we want to be. We just expect them to be there. It's not exciting stuff. It's the day-to-day -day stuff. And it's very easy just to quietly strip out the resources that enable you know, that day-to-day management of the environment that we just expect to be there, to just keep on happening. So this is possibly our, our deep oceanic current that we need to be swimming against. But maybe I'll, I'll see if Steve wants to make a comment. I just make a point that there will be a government consultation about the future of the new energy protection service. And I hope we will be vigorously making representations like that. Anybody else? Paul then? Can I turn the, the debate in a slightly different direction? And I'll ask, um, I suppose, particularly, um, Steve and Alex, um, about whether the debate we're having is a generalised UK one, or whether there are real and probably widening gaps between England and Scotland, and Wales for that matter. Um, and clearly there is the prospect of that gap widening more. And my impression is that cultural heritage generally has been higher up the political agenda in Scotland over the last 20 or 30 years than it is in England. And obviously resources flow from that um, position, if I'm right. Um, I think there is a gap over a variety of ways with some of the legislation and approaches and funding. So, um, I think in terms of legislation approaches, that may not be something the sector needs to worry about. And you have devolution and you develop decision making to worry about um, increasing local accountability, and that's the way it's going to go. In terms of funding, um, yes, there has been a significant difference uh, in the levels of funding as far as we can see. Oh, it's a difficult calculation to make, and I think it does reflect the different standing. Um, heritage in those three countries. I wouldn't want to speculate on the reasons why I like to know. Thank you. What a great question. <laughs> and I'm so glad I'm not supported by anyone here from Scotland, unfortunately. It's a shame there aren't more people from Scotland included. I'm sure they've been invited. So. It is a very tumultuous time currently. We are going through a long transition process for the Royal Commission and Historic Scotland, where on the one hand you have a body of survey and recording, a public body, and on the other hand you have a government agency, civil servants, and the transition to merge to create what will be a new body, because it was first perceived that this would be a wine table and that would be it. And, but, contribution from the wider historic environment sector ensured that the Minister was made very clear that this was an extremely important issue and that it could not be just done with a swoop of pain. Now, your question is more about political use of heritage potentially in Scotland currently, which run the run up to the 2015 <coughs> referendum will be extremely important. And a lot of the commentary from my colleagues in Historic Scotland. Let's call it Historic Scotland, okay? Because that's probably what the name's going to be for the human body. We can't forward to give it a new name. So I'm a member of the Historic Scotland Payroll Board. Not yet, but I will be eventually. Um, colleagues are talking, discussing openly about the importance of the big sites, the honeypot sites, the important cultural heritage site, Bathburn, for example. These are all the important things. Now, I'm interested in the lumps and bumps and fields as well, but don't get statutory protection, but we need to maintain the expertise, the partnerships, and the ability and capacity in the sector to go and record those and get them into the planning system, get them into the education system, and into the research um, databases as well. Um, so, yes, there, I think there is a growing difference, and it may be exemplified best of all, sorry, this is rather garbled. 
festival by we have a culture minister as well. Uh, I don't think we have that. So there is a there are distinct differences as well. I'm not saying good or bad. I'm just observing. I'm doing a classic. Yes, it's a square paragraph. It's got you know, measures X, Y, and Z. Who's there in it? I think we are we are really roaming into lunch actually. So um, I know one or two people wanted to make a very is it a sort of one or two sentence comment from Yeah? All right, Adrian. Oh. I can stand up and shout. Adrian Olivia at UCL. It seems to me we've heard a massive amount of fantastic stuff yesterday and today about localism, about community archaeology and community activism. And it's always been there. It's been there since the 50s. It's just getting better and better and better. But the paradox to me, and I think it's the paradox that's highlighted by Lloyd, and, and brought into focus by what Steve just said, referring to the government consultation about heritage protection in England, encouraging us all to write in. My view is it could be a waste of time. Government will just think it's the same usual players making the same comments coming from the same bit of the sector. The paradox is how do we get all those activists and community archaeologists to exercise their voice and participate in that democratic process on our behalf? And I'm still struggling to do that. It seems to me that that was the challenge that Lloyd threw out to us this morning. And I don't know how we do it, and I wish I did. All right, and I think that's a challenge we can take with us into lunch. Um, so, debate. Um, if you have further questions for our speakers, they'll all be there over lunch. So, tackle them, don't let them eat, ask them what you want. Thanks very much, everybody.